Uh, quickly before we start into stuff, we've got a couple of members of CASA here to do a quick announcement about the test workshop. A test workshop next week Monday from 3 to 6 in UCF 301 the information is on the slides Nick do you want to tell them how to get there yeah if you guys don't know where UCF 301 is it's uh, it's a little weird because it's not in the main UC building what you want to do is you just go down the hall this way and then up through the left door and you'll get out in the quad and if you look across the quad there'll just be a bunch of letters on like the top of the wall and we're in the F wing all the way on the top floor in room 301. Do you want to tell them what's going to happen at the yeah, workshop? Yeah, so we'll start off first. We'll go through some terms that might be on the test. We'll try to list off all of them. And then we'll actually go through and get you guys to come up with an answer for one of these terms. And while we're doing that, we'll go through like the grading rubric. And so how each, each question will actually be graded on the test. Uh, we'll go over some study tips, like what you can do with study groups, sort of games you can play. And then we'll answer like any of your questions you might have. All right. Any? On Monday? Yeah. Not at this class. Oh, sorry. What if one has class? Oh, sorry. Um, well, uh, yeah, we'll be posting notes in the uh, COG250 group chat that we made on, or the, the group that we made on Facebook. So we'll have like a document with, uh, with all the notes from the session on. So we'll be posting that. Okay, any other questions? Great, okay. thank you guys. Thanks so much. So that's again, that's the same office that uh, the CASA office hours are in. I think it's the same time as the regular office hours, so yeah, okay, so. Okay. Uh, any course business we wanna deal with before we get going? All right, so to review. Last time we talked, we began and finished talking about memory as a potential basic cognitive process. We noticed that memory is pervasive across all of our cognitive processes. Like you really don't get far unless you have memory in terms of categorization and kind of imagine trying to do problem solving without memory. Again, you're, you're just not, it's not gonna work, right? So maybe memory is gonna be the basic cognitive process in terms of which we can analyze all of the other ones. We started, as we usually do, from kind of common sense notions about memory. We started from this broad metaphor, the spatial metaphor of memory. The idea being that memory is like a space. And in that space, you keep stable memories in stable locations. Uh, and then memory retrieval is just searching through that space, trying to find the relevant memory, bringing it up into the light of consciousness. Uh, and then we talked about, all, we, we briefly, met, I think I briefly mentioned that this is kind of, it's just a metaphor, but theorizing about memory before about the 1970s largely took on at least two of the assumptions of this metaphor, which is that memories are stable objects stored in stable locations. And then we tried to pick apart this, this kind of assumed framework. We talked about how memory is reconstructive, not reproductive. And we talked about that under a number of different sort of experiments and ways of thinking about memory bunch of empirical results that suggest that, as a matter of fact, you reconstruct the past. And we talked about how that might be a rational strategy for you, right? This, this is not, I mean, it's sort of, I found this horrifying when I first learned it, but I've tried to make the case that actually this is the way that you want your memory to function. You want your memory not to be just a blank, like a simple recorder of events that you have to then go through every single event in your life. What you want your memory to do is pick out patterns and generality and generate meaning from your experiences. So what your, what your memory seems to track and seems to drag out of the world isn't just what happened, but what it meant to you. The significance or the relevance of the events in your life seems to be what sticks much more than just what happened. We talked about the levels of processing account. The levels of processing account was that your memory and your processing are kind of deeply interlinked. And the proposal from Craig and Lockhart was that the more deeply you process information, the more you're likely to remember it. And they had this kind of vague metaphor of depth of processing that we cashed out in terms of things like, did you just look at the shape of the letters? 
Did you try to understand what the word actually means or the sounds of the word? Or did you understand the semantic meaning, the actual significance of the word? So the more deeply, if those are levels, then the more deeply you processed the things you experience, the more likely you are to remember them. Uh, and then we kind of asked some questions about even that. So that was a that was an advance on the, the, the mere kind of like memory boxes account of memory. Um, but we nonetheless had to ask some serious questions about that. For example, there were a bunch of facts about memory that don't seem to be at least cleanly explained by the levels of processing approach. So it's not that the levels of processing approach was shown to be wrong by this, but rather it just seems to go beyond what they had to say about how memory works. For example, encoding specificity. That is the fact that seemingly extraneous details about your environment can be important to how you're later going to retrieve the memory. So if you, uh, if you practice welding above water and then try to do it underwater, you'll be much less able to do welding underwater than if you'd practiced underwater. If you study for a test while you're taking aspirin, at the test you should take an aspirin, that kind of thing. Uh, so that doesn't seem to be just a built-in feature of the levels of processing approach. It seems like your brain is doing something a little bit fancier. And I made a suggestion to you what that fancier thing might be, which is that what you're trying to do, what your brain is trying to do, is to generate transfer appropriate processing. That is, the, that is what your brain is trying to do is solve this really difficult problem for you. And it is a monumentally difficult problem given that what it's trying to do is extract the meaning and significance from the world. Because you don't always know ahead of time how you're gonna need to use the information that you're taking in. So if you're, if you're in a situation, it's not always super clear how you need to process it in order to transfer it to future situations that you're in. So uh, memory seems to have to face this problem about problem solving. So your memory is tuned up, it appears, from all the empirical evidence we looked at, to solve this problem of doing transfer appropriate processing, which is in a sense saying, your memory has to be apt for problem solving. So somehow, your memory is tuned up to help you solve problems, rather than accurately reproduce the past as you experienced it. And again, this is probably the way that you want your memory to be. It's much more important that at least in evolutionary terms and probably in human existential terms, that you be able to solve problems. Much more important that you be able to solve problems than to accurately remember the past. If you care a lot about accurately remembering the past, write a diary, take a lot of pictures, you can externalize that stuff. The stuff you want in your head is the ability to uh, deal with the kind of situations that you're gonna experience in the future. Sometimes you know what those situations are gonna be, sometimes you don't. So there's this really gnarly information problem that your memory is facing and that it seems to be tuned up to be solving, which is the problem of extracting meaning from the world in a way that it's going to be, rel it's going to be processed properly to deal with situations in the future. Obviously, we don't solve that perfectly every time, but we do an actually really impressive job of it. So where that left us was with the interconnection problem. So uh, it happened again. We got, to the, we got to the heart of categorization and it seemed like you needed to know something about problem solving. When we got to the micro theory, theories are for basically figuring out things in your world. P problem solving for understanding and explaining is a kind of problem solving. So we got to the heart of, as far as we got in categorization, we found problem solving. As far as we got in memory, we found problem solving. We also found, of course, me memory inside of categorization, memory inside of problem solving. And of course, we're gonna find categorization and problem inside problem solving. All of these potential basic cognitive processes seem to presuppose the other potential basic cognitive processes, which is we could call that the interconnection problem in cognitive science. Um, so this is frustrating, this is difficult, this is uh, one of the reasons why it's so hard to analyze cognition because there's so much smart stuff going on in the background that's just not present to our consciousness. And, when, and this is why trying to do 
analysis, formalization, and ultimately mechanization is so important for this particular discipline because it's not like in chemistry you find out that there's a little homunculus in your theory solving problems for you. That's just not how chemistry goes. Whereas in cognitive science, we're trying to understand mostly through uh, behavioral and introspective studies how our own minds work and our minds are just doing a lot of stuff in the background that we're unaware of. So things that looked easy turn out to be hard. And that's gonna be the story basically for problem solving again. A bunch of stuff that looked easy turns out to be really, really hard. Uh, but nonetheless, we'll make a little more progress, as I've been promising, on problem solving than we did in categorization or memory. Okay? Questions about where we're at? Okay. So, let's move on to our final potential basic cognitive process, problem solving. So, problem solving does seem to have come up in the last two, so maybe this is where we're going to make some progress. Um, this time we're not going to really start with an intuitive picture. We'll start with the work of Newland Simon, which was absolutely central to the development of cognitive science as a program because these guys are like the cognitive scientists. They, they are the archetype of cognitive scientists. Uh, their work is really important in psychology. It's really important in AI. It's important in economics. Uh, and they're doing this really interdisciplinary work where they're specifically trying to analyze, formalize, and mechanize intelligence. So their goal was to generate artificially intelligent programs. And what they called this, unfortunately for us today, what they tried to build was a general problem solver, a GPS. And if you tell people you have a GPS now, they're super unimpressed. Uh, so I don't know, we have gotta change the acronym or something. But okay, so think about, think about machines. Think about the machines that you have available to you. So here is a machine. It is a perfectly good water holding machine, right? It's a single purpose machine. Here's another machine, it's a little mouse. Perfectly good for moving a cursor around the screen, but it's just got that one function, right? This is not a general problem solver. It is a single use problem solver. And practically all of the AI we have today is single purpose problem solvers. So you have to tell it what kind of problem it's gonna be working on, what the success conditions look like, and what operations it has available to it before an AI can deal with a problem. Now, that's clearly not what you're like, right? You are general purpose problem solvers. That is, you're able to deal with problems in a huge variety of domains, and Newland Simon's proposal is that we can think about intelligence simply as general problem solving abilities. So if you can build a machine that is a general problem solver, you've done the work of at least analyzing and formalizing and maybe mechanizing some aspects of intelligence. So these guys are absolutely central. They are like the quintessential cognitive scientists. Uh, so like, you know that it's not gonna work out though, right? Like. Given, given the lack of general problem solvers, like intelligent robots running around today, you know that this program isn't gonna pan out, unfortunately. But its failure is, and this is very typical of the scientific process, its failure was very instructive. The ways in which this project failed gives us a, some deep insights into what the nature of intelligence is. That's, our, that's gonna be our talk, the, like the topic today. We're gonna go through their basic project, show how it fails, and show what that teaches us about problem solving and maybe intelligence in general. So, so they really did build one of these things. They really did build a computer program that could solve some problems. So the kind of problems that they had to solve were things like producing proofs in uh, sentential logic. So they considered, you know, if you're trying to think of what's an intelligent thing to do, well, deriving theorems and logic struck them as quintessentially human level intelligence and they built a program and the program was actually able to generate some proofs. They started from uh, empirical studies. They would have students, first year students, university students who are learning logic sit down and try to do it. This is a, this is a proof in logic. Uh, try to do one of these proofs 
and they'd have them speak out loud and say what it is they were doing. And then they used that kind of the process that they were using to try to model their logic solving program. Now, of course, that's a, so the, the goal of a proof is to try to do a bunch of transformations that start from basically just some premises and some axioms. And those premises and axioms are like rules that you can use to apply to transform the state of the system until you get the thing that you're trying to derive. Yeah? Uh, so sentential logic, yeah, uh, I believe. So, uh, but that's of course not a general problem solver. So what made Newell and Simon think that they'd produce something that they would legitimately call a general problem solver is that the problem solving unit of the thing was separate from the, the thing that specifies the actual operations that it would be performing. So they've got a sort of general problem solving unit and then another unit that does the actual work of trying to solve the problem. You can do this kind of thing. So they applied it to things like logic, first order logic, uh, geometry, and their goal was to deal with chess. And that's kind of where things will start to get interesting. So let's talk for a little bit about what their analysis of problem solving is. So here's their analysis of problem solving. It's supposed to be uh, so you got what is problem, you ask yourself, what is problem solving? And an analysis would take problem solving apart into its various parts. And if you understand the parts, then you understand problem solving. So a problem is the following. So you've got an initial state, a thing where you, the place where you're starting and you've got a goal state. And the problem they say is the difference between the initial state and the goal state. My problem is I am hungry and my goal state is not being hungry anymore. Yeah, sort of very standard problem. Or my, my initial state is the opening positions for chess and my goal state is having my opponent's king in checkmate. Is anybody, is everybody aware of, like if I use chess metaphors, is that okay for, not really? So I'm seeing some people go like, I don't really know, but okay. So uh, initial state is any, wherever you are, the goal state is wherever you're trying to get, okay. And then uh, you've got, so those, to specify a problem, you need to specify an initial state, a goal state, and then you need to specify a set of operators. Operators are the moves that you're allowed to make to transform the initial state into the goal state. So you're supposed to have a specific, a kind of finite list of operators that are available to you, and those are how you move through what's called the space, the search space. And then of course you have, not of course, but they also say you have path constraints. So path constraints are uh, constraints on which operators you're allowed to use. So a path constraint, one important path constraint is that you shouldn't be, you shouldn't make a series of moves. You shouldn't use a series of operators that undermines your capacity to be a general problem solver. So if I, uh, I forgot to pay my cable bill. One way of solving that problem is to kill myself. And that solves the cable bill problem, doesn't it? Uh, but that makes all of your, it actually solves a lot of your problems, but it ruins your ability, it ruins your ability to be a general problem solver. So that violates the path constraints. You want to stay, you want to stay a general problem solver, stay in the game of attempting to solve problems. Otherwise you lose completely, right? So path constraints like maintain yourself as a general problem solver. Okay, so those are the kind of the basic elements of their analysis of what a problem is. Uh, here's a couple more. So a problem solution is a pathway through what they call the search space, through the space of from the initial condition, right, a, a, a problem solution is a series of operators that takes you from the initial condition to the goal state, right? So there might be many problem solutions for a given problem. Uh, there might be none. Problem, a problem solving method is a collection of problem solutions or a, a method of finding problem solutions, yeah? So if you've got a strategy for playing chess or whatever your favorite game is, that would be a problem solving method. 
And then they propose that we can actually analyze intelligence as having a collection of problem solving methods. So having a variety of ways of finding problem solutions is, they propose, how we should think about intelligence. Okay, so there's their analysis. And it, I mean, it probably saw, sounds mildly trivial. It probably sounds mildly trivial. So the, the strong claim being made here, not is that, it's not that a goal, the, like, Nobody was super impressed. They said problem solving is trying to get you from your initial state to your goal state. Nobody was super impressed by that. The, the interesting claim here is that these concepts from this slide and the last one are all that you need in order to understand problem solving and then intelligence. So that's the strong claim. If you claim to have analyzed problem solving, that's what you're claiming, that you've taken it apart into all of the relevant bits, laid out all of the relevant bits, there's nothing left over. There's nothing more you need to, there's no more bits and pieces that you need in order to put something together and be problem solving or in fact intelligence. Okay. So even from this rather crude diagram, you can start to see some of the limitations of this picture. So this, this diagram is misleading in an important way because you're starting from the goal state over here on the left. What you don't have is a top-down map of where everything's gonna lead. You don't have pre-specified for you, typically. You don't know where each operation is gonna take you until you've applied the operation, right? You don't have this God's eye view of the problem space. And one of the most important things that comes out of Newell and Simon's research program is that they very quickly noticed, and this is not just something that they, they didn't like do a bunch of work and then notice this. This is in the early publications about this stuff. They very quickly noticed that these search spaces tend to be ginormous, really absurdly ginormous. Uh, that is to say, and let me, okay, so like, it's hard, to, it's hard to overstate how ginormous they are. I'm gonna use chess as an example, uh, as one of my examples. So the concept of co uh, the combinatorial explosion. This is Holyoke's, uh, Keith Holyoke coined this term. It's a really good term. Combinatorial explosion is when the search space, the space of possible moves that you can make with your operators becomes so absurdly large that there's no possibility of exhaustively tracing it out. So uh, game tree complexity is the, the number of possible different games you could play. So uh, the number of possible different ways a game could go. Yeah. So the game tree complexity is given by the number of available moves raised to the power of the number of moves in the game. And just for example, so chess, there's about 30 moves, 30 potential moves that you can make at each turn with an average of something like 60 turns per game, giving you something, a game tree complexity for the average game, of something like four times 10 to the 88th. Four times 10 to the 88th. Now, how do you feel about that number? Would you like to have that much money? <laughs> yeah, well, you'd probably ruin the, uh, and that makes so, uh, Go, the, the game right here is called Go. Uh, it's a much, much larger game. So uh, games between experts last about 150 moves and there's about 250 moves available on average for each of those moves, giving you a game tree complexity of something like 10 to the 360. Uh, so the, and these are like, Relative to the kind of problems that you're facing in your average, on, on, your, on a daily basis, these are hilariously simple games. Really, like, really compared to the problem that you are facing right now. So currently, many of you are taking notes. And that, think about how the number of, if you think these are large numbers, the number of possible sentences in English is, puts these to shame. And you think, well, geez. How are you doing that? Um, so you have something like 10 to the 11 neurons 
Uh, so, and maybe, maybe you're like, oh, well, it's not the number of neurons, it's the number of connections. I know, you know, my brain, what I heard was, what I was told was, my brain is the most complex entity in the universe. In the known universe, my brain is the most complex thing, which is clearly false because your brain interacting with any other system is more complex than your brain. Like two people talking to each other is two brains interfacing, so that's more complex. But nonetheless, you might think, okay, well, maybe, maybe the, just the, the immense complexity of my brain lets me deal with these huge search spaces. Uh, you know, maybe it's the number of, compare this to the number of connections in your brain. So you've got something like 10 to the 15 connections in your brain. Well, 10 to the 15 times 10 to the 360, or, or like compared to 10 to the 360, the number of synapses in your brain is incredibly tiny. The number of synaptic connections in your brain is hilariously tiny compared to these. These numbers make astronomical scale numbers look silly, silly small by comparison. So the number of partic elementary particles in the visible universe is something like 10 to the 80. The number of nanoseconds since the Big Bang is something like 10 to the 26. So the number of possible games of Go is 10 to the 254 times larger than those two numbers multiplied together. So if every subatomic particle in the entire universe went through an entire game of Go every nanosecond since the Big Bang, it wouldn't even begin to, to exhaust that search space. It wouldn't even touch it, not 1%, not, not one billionth of 1% of that search space could be investigated. So this is combinatorial explosion. This is a, I propose to you, a mathematical proof that we can be certain of one thing here, which is that we're not solving, like humans play these games on the regular. We're okay at them. You can be absolutely certain that the way we are not playing these games is by exhaustively looking at the search space, right? What we're not doing when we play Go, or we play chess, or we play any of the other games, that, m most of the other games that we play, what we're not doing is completely looking at the whole search space unintelligently, and then just picking the winner. Yeah? Yeah. Are you going to get into games that aren't perfect information games, like rock, paper, scissors, but that we don't know all available, like the state of the board at a given time? I wasn't. I wasn't going to do that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I heard rock, the, the ideal strategy for rock, paper, scissors is just no strategy at all. Random usually gets around 50%. Yeah. You can begin to predict other people's patterns first. Yeah. Um, okay. So we talked a little bit about this last time. This is what we call the finitary predicament. The finitary predicament has come back again. And it... So when Newell and Simon... Again, they, they, they produced this general problem solver. They started doing an analysis of problem solving, and what they found almost immediately was the finitary predicament. The size of their search spaces immediately became, like they started trying to work on chess. Let's build, let's build us a chess playing program. They considered chess to be like the epitome of human intelligence. Things like solving logic problems and playing chess, which tells you something about what their lives were like, because that's, I don't know, I don't know, I think you can be a profoundly unintelligent person, but nonetheless be good at chess, but whatever. So uh, the revealing thing that this research program produced for us was that intelligence is probably centrally uh, focused on, like what, what it is to be intelligent is almost certainly to have some solution to the finitary predicament. Being intelligent is not just a matter of being able to apply rules and transform your state from one thing to another, right? Because just being able to do that clearly doesn't let us solve the kind of problems that we solve all the time, right? It's just obviously not how we do it. So intelligence, they start to realize, Newell and Simon, early in this research pro program, intelligence has something to do with intelligently ignoring almost all of the search space. 
Your capacity to ignore possibilities is foundational to human level intelligence. And notice that you can't ignore these possibilities. Here's what you cannot be doing. Again, you can be certain that what you're not doing is looking through the whole search space, finding the solution, and then ignoring the rest of it. Because you don't have time. I hope, I hope those staggering, like, make astronomical figures made it very apparent that I'm not just sort of like underestimating this, I, my mighty brain, you're underestimating how clever I am. No, there's just not enough space in the entire universe to do that task. So that means that you have to intelligently ignore, not even consider the vast, vast majority of the search spaces that you're facing. Without even considering those possibilities, you have to home in on just the relevant ones. So dealing with combinatorial explosion, dealing with our computational limits, somehow managing the finitary predicament and dealing with the fact that the world just vastly, vastly, vastly outstrips our ability to come to terms with it exhaustively is core to intelligence. So this is a victory, I propose. This is a, a, a research victory. By failing at their task, Newell and Simon showed us that this problem of ignoring possibilities is central to intelligence. And I bet that wasn't obvious to you before you started thinking about this. I bet if somebody asked you, what is it to be intelligent? You wouldn't have said, well, it's ignoring a bunch of stuff. That's, what it, that's what's constitutive of intelligence, is ignoring the stuff that doesn't matter. Um, so this is why we do formalization and analyze, analysis and mechanization. Not always because we succeed, but sometimes because our failures are illustrative. Yeah? Okay. So. Okay, so we know that we're not exhaustively going through these search spaces. Let's take that as red, yeah? So what are we doing? Uh, Newell and Simon have a kind of answer for this. They have a proposal. So consider the following two terms, and I'd like to just warn you that they're using these terms in a way that they're not used today. So these, I'm gonna, these, let's, let's mark these two words off as jargon in this class, right? For in this class, these two words are gonna have specific meanings that they don't always have in other places in the world, okay? Is that fair? Okay, so back in the day, back in Newell and Simon's day, an algorithm meant the following. A problem-solving technique guaranteed to find a solution or to prove that no solution exists, right? It's a, it's a problem-solving technique that always works in the sense that sometimes it just shows you that there was no solution in the first place. So there are, there are lots of algorithms in the world, right? There is a tic-tac-toe playing algorithm. That search space is pretty small. You can, you can sort out all of the possible games of tic-tac-toe and you can build an algorithm that always plays as well as you can possibly play. I think checkers too. I think checkers is like a small enough game that we've mapped out all of the possibilities and you, you, there are techniques, I mean, that, that a computer can run where you're either always gonna win or draw in checkers. So algorithms, we got lots of them. You've got algorithms for stuff. Stuff like if I pose you this really challenging problem, what's six times eight, right? Hopefully you've got an algorithm somewhere in your, somewhere in your memory that you can solve that, right? You can, this is a solvable problem and you can be pretty confident. Or like, how many people are in this room? You believe, I hope you believe, that there is an algorithm for solving the how many people are in the room problem, right? Right? Yeah. Okay, good, good, okay. Okay, so we got lots of algorithms on the table. Algorithms are great. If an algorithm is available and it's fairly straightforward to run, you want the algorithm because it gives you an answer. Uh, but what I just showed you is that, I think what I just showed you is that oftentimes algorithms are not gonna be available just due to the computational problems involved. The scale of the computation rules out being able to create an algorithm. Uh, so here's another type of thing, a heuristic. So a heuristic, again, for the purposes of this course, is a problem-solving technique that is not guaranteed to find a solution, but which aims at increasing your chances of finding one. So it's a technique that's not always gonna work. A heuristic is one where 
you're gonna, even if you follow the heuristic perfectly, you're sometimes gonna fail. So, any chess players in the room? Okay, what are some strategies that you use to play chess? Yeah. You wanna attack the center? Yeah, to attack the center, control the center. And have you ever done that, but nonetheless lost the game? Yeah, a lot. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, it, but it's nonetheless a good strategy, right? It's a good move to, it's a good thing to do. You try to control the center. You try to, you try to make sure that your opponent can't like freely move their pieces around the center. That increases your likelihood. And even the best players do this, right? Even the best players try to control the center because it increases the likelihood that you're going to win. Nonetheless, you're still sometimes going to, you can do that, but nonetheless, you can still sometimes lose. So heuristics, are what Newell and Simon thought we're probably using to solve problems. Uh, those problems that are, go beyond our ability to generate and execute algorithms for, probably we're mostly using heuristics. So when they talked about problem solving uh, techniques, that's, this is what they have in mind for most of our techniques. So uh, they've got some specific heuristics that they use. I would like to just step back a little bit and talk about some general heuristics that people think and talk about just to kind of get the, get the idea of heuristics really, really robust and clear in our minds, if that's okay. So I'm gonna start with a really bad one though. I'll start with a really bad one. Here's a, here's a thing, when, when you ask people how they solve problems, here's a thing that they often tell you and, that, and they're wrong. So they tell you that they do trial and error. How'd you solve that? Ah, trial and error. Where you just basically sample the search space randomly. Maybe this'll work. Maybe that'll work. Maybe this'll work. They just randomly sample the search space. Um, if your search space is small enough and rich enough in solutions, that's okay. Like if there's, if every, if 50% of all the possible paths through the space are solutions, yeah, sure, random sample, go for it. But notice that almost all of the problems that you face aren't like that. So consider the making lunch problem. This is a problem, we face it on a regular basis. I hope many of you solve this on a regular basis. And imagine of the space of all possible operations available to you for the making lunch problem, you attempted trial and error. So I've got all kinds of movements that I can do with my body. I'm, imagine I'm in my kitchen. Here's what I'm gonna try to do. I'm gonna kick my right leg and then wave my left arm and then sing a little song just randomly try stuff. How long do you think it's gonna be before lunch appears in front of me? Assuming somebody hasn't taken pity on me and just made me lunch. Like, you're gonna die first, right? You're gonna starve to death in your own kitchen trying to use this heuristic to, to solve the fairly straightforward, from our perspective, making lunch problem, right? Uh, I've got a picture of monkeys at typewriters because of course in principle this is true right like so if you if you in in principle this is a way of finding a solution do you know the famous if if you put an infinite number of monkeys at an infinite number of typewriters eventually one of them is going to write hamlet and that's true if you had an infinite number of monkeys actually it wouldn't just be infinite it would be as fast as a monkey could type one of them would produce hamlet um, but short of an infinite number of monkeys that's not really gonna be in general a good, a good way of solving problems. I'm, I don't really understand why people report this as their problem solving techniques so often. I think it's just that they don't have good introspective access to how they're actually solving the problem because typical search spaces for typical problems are humongous and pr actual solutions are very rare in the, in the total space. So when somebody tells you trial and error, what they probably mean is they used a bunch of other heuristics and then just didn't get disappointed when they didn't work a couple of times. I think that's, re in reality, what trial and error means is I tried a whole bunch of smart stuff and failed a bunch and didn't give up. So other heuristics are probably operating in the background. Okay. So this is not a good heuristic because it, what doesn't do what heuristics are for. So heuristics are for cutting down your search space, right? Cut, making, making the unimaginably vast search space smaller for yourself. So you don't have to search all of it. You don't have to deal with the whole thing, right? And this is just 
oh, I'm just going to randomly sample. So that's a terrible heuristic. Don't, don't use this heuristic. But plain tic-tac-toe, go ahead. But. Okay, here's another one. Uh, the availability heuristic, sometimes called the availability bias. And that makes sense because heuristics are biases. They are biases towards looking at just some small part of the search space. So uh, if something is, here's the heuristic, if something is easy to recall, people find it to be more probable. So this is a problem you face all the time, estimating the probability of things. If you're trying to figure out some, the, risks, the risks and rewards of a certain type of behavior, you will estimate the probability of various outcomes, kind of unconsciously, intuitively. Uh, and so you've got this problem of estimating probabilities. And people estimate the probability of something to be much higher if they find it easy to remember. So uh, this is an empirical study where people were asked to estimate the number of words that start with K versus the number of words that start with, or that have K as the third letter. So knight, knife, kin, kind, kippers, right? It's fairly easy to generate words that start with K, so they're very available. It seems to be one of the ways that your brain indexes words is by their first letter. But it doesn't really do as good a job of indexing things by their third letter. What's a word with a third letter K? Yeah. Ask, oh, that's a good one. Oh. I would have found that a hard task. T-A-S, that's fourth letter, okay. So uh, because people find it easier to recall letters with the, you know, the words by the first letter, uh, they estimated the number of words that start with K to be much higher than the number of words that, start, that have K as the third letter. But this is an objective fact, right? You can go through the dictionary and count. How many K words are there? How many words with K as the third letter are there? And you can compare. And people were way off. They thought there's way more that start with K and there's way less than in actual fact that have K as the third letter because this is the availability heuristic. Why should we be like this? You can always ask yourself, why would God slash evolution do this to us? Well, here's an, here's an answer. It is exceptionally difficult to actually calculate the probability of real world events. It is unbelievably difficult. What you have to do, what you would have to do is the following. You would have to go through everything that's ever happened to you in your entire life, count up how many times that thing you're interested in happened, and then compare that to the set of all things that happened, right? Like you need to know the distribution of the event in the domain of possibilities is what you do. That's how you calculate the probability of something. So that calculus is torturously difficult. Uh, but if something is easy to remember, that's a kind of quick proxy for how probable it is. Uh, what it's, what the, fact, the fact that we've got this kind of hardwired into us suggests to me is that it's a good enough proxy to increase your probability above chance. And that's all it needs to be in order to get it to be selected for by evolution. Here's another one. Here's a, a very similar one. The representativeness heuristic. So if something is very salient or prototypical, if it jumps out at your attention, people tend to judge it to be much more likely. So the problem is the same. Estimate the likelihood of an event. And if something is attention grabbing or happened recently or is very, very culturally significant, you'll estimate its probability to be much higher than if something is not that salient. So this is a, I'll steal one more anecdote from Professor Viveki. Have you ever driven to the airport? And when some, you're, you're, either you or your friend is getting on the plane and you get nervous when they're like, oh, call me when you get there. Like, tell me that the flight went okay. I will have a safe flight. You know, I hope everything's okay. You know, I'm really, I'll be thinking about you until you land, I'll be worried. And then you get it in the car where you're like a thousand times more likely to die in the car ride home than on the airplane. The airplane, airplanes mile for mile are the safest way to travel. And cars are just death machines. We report vehicular deaths kind of like the weather. Like we say like, 
yeah, it's kind of drizzly. It's a bit, uh, it's 14 degrees. Six people died in the 401 today, so leave a bit early, you know? Like, it doesn't get that. Whereas if, if a plane crashes, that's international news for days, right? They show the footage, it's horrifying, flames and wreckage everywhere, you know? So somehow plane crashes have got a much stronger grip on our imagination than car crashes do, despite being air travel in general being radically safer than car travel. So nobody ever gets on the plane and then says to their friend, call me when the taxi gets home, uh, be safe, buckle up. You know, I'm really praying for you to make it home on your car ride from the airport. That's just not a thing that happens, right? So representation, representativeness heuristic, what we're doing is using how much it pops in your brain as a proxy for how probable it is. Um, and our politicians are using this bias all the time to trick us into supporting policies that we shouldn't. They get, they get a crying person on the news for some extremely low probability event, and they tell you their name and some of their backstory, so it makes it salient to you uh, when what you should really be worried about is like heart disease and poverty. Like compare, again, compare like, sorry, this is, I'll just rant a little bit longer and then I'll let you have a break, but like compare how much of our imagination terrorism takes up compared to poverty. Hundreds of people die every year in this city from cold. Every year. Can you imagine if 100 people died in a terrorist attack in Toronto? That would be, that would be international news for weeks. We would radically transform our society. You'd have to take off your shoes to get on the subway, right? But hundreds of homeless people die. They don't, we're not, we're, and we're, we, indifference, right? So you should be, we should be much, much, much worried about things like poverty and heart disease and air pollution because, but we not, we're, we're interested in flashy things that have like a, a big, big pop and big, big interest in your brain. Uh, so this, this is a bias that we've got built in. It's a bias, but biases and heuristics are kind of the same thing. A bias is a way of not having to deal with the unbelievable complexity of the search space, focus your attention just on one little part of it, right? So to deal with combinatorial explosion, what we do is bias our attention in various ways. Um, I'm sad to tell you that telling you about these biases, they've done studies on whether people who've learned about these biases are less subject to them. We're not, <laughs> sorry. So this is not going to cure you of these, learning about this does not cure you of these biases, but it is worth knowing about. Uh, and I think it's, yeah, for our purposes, it's very interesting to think about the, the computational task that we're facing, this intractable computational task, which we deal with in terms of a whole variety of heuristics. Okay, one or two more heuristics, shall we? So here's one, hill climbing heuristic. Uh, so given some kind of feedback, literally imagine blindfolding somebody and telling them you'll give them a million dollars if they can climb to the top of a hill. Here's what they do. And it was a very, it would be a very sensible strategy. Of course, they would just orient themselves to wherever they're going up. Right? So if you start on the left here, you just move in the direction where you're going up. Right? And when you start to go down, you stop pretty good. Right? So it's a heuristic. It's a, not a perfect way of getting through your search space, but it's not bad. Um, this is how we uh, prescribe drugs, for example. So if you go to the doctor and you say, I feel terrible, uh, one of the things they might offer you is some antidepressants. And here's how they decide what dose to give you. Hill climbing heuristic. Say, here's a hundred milligrams. Come back in two weeks. Come back in two weeks and you say, well, I feel a little better. Say, great. 150, come back in two weeks. Okay, this is assuming you have great healthcare and great turnaround on your, usually it's months, but uh, come back in two weeks, uh, it's okay. Great, here's 250, yeah. When you get to the top of the hill, if you get to 250 milligrams, you say, okay, I feel worse now. They'll say, okay, back to 200. So what's the problem with this? Yeah. Like 
Yeah, it's the right side of the thing. It's the right side of the thing, right? So if you get to that local maximum, the hill climbing heuristic gives you no method to go back down, right? Right? Yeah. Okay, so this is not a problem solving technique that's gonna deal with all of your problems by any means, right? But given limited feedback, it's a reasonable one. Okay. Right, so those are some specific heuristics, some fairly specific ones. They're good for specific tasks. They're reasonable for reasonably constrained problems that you're dealing with. Newell and Simon, to return to this thing, this research program that we started with, remember, they were trying to come up with a general heuristic, a general heuristic that could be applied to any problem. That was their goal, and they had a, they had a couple of proposals. Um, so I'll show you their heuristic in a second. Again, this is going to turn out not to be super tractable. This is not going to turn out to be a, like, <laughs> again, given the lack of intelligent robots running around, yeah, this is, this is not going to work out. But here's what they did. So they try to do what's called the means ends heuristic. So uh, here's the heuristic. Here's the thing that they programmed their general problem solver. Remember this thing that was supposed to solve logic problems and maybe some geometry problems and hopefully chess. They programmed it with the means ends heuristic and also some planning stuff. Yeah, okay. So uh, here's what the means ends heuristic does. Examine the initial state and the goal state. Then identify salient differences between the goal state and the initial state. And that sentence should have your COG 250 senses tingling already, because what do you mean by salient? Uh, okay, but you've identified some salient differences between your goal state and your end state, such as I am hungry and I wish to not be hungry. Okay. What do you do? You choose an operator, identify an operator that would reduce the difference. So if I was putting a sandwich into my mouth, that would reduce the difference between my goal state and my initial state, right? Okay, but very often, typically, you don't, it's not just a one operation like initial state to goal state. You have to, you're, the operator that you would like to apply, which is put sandwich in my mouth, is not available from the initial state, okay. So it's a kind of recursive process. Given, okay, I want to apply this operator, sandwich in mouth, good. How do I get from my initial state to the state where I can apply that operator? So then you generate a sub goal. Okay, I would like to have made a sandwich, good. What do I do to get to that sub goal? First, I take the bread out of the bread box and I take some cold cuts out of the fridge put them together, right? So it's a kind of iterative uh, process of identifying operators that you would like to apply and then developing a sub goal that would allow you to get to that operator. And then a sub sub goal that gets you to that operator, sub 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 goal, and so on and so on. And this worked pretty good for solving logical derivations in sentential logic. Yeah, that's, that's not bad. Uh, it does face the combinatorial explosion problem. Uh, it does face a number of fairly serious problems. So, like, as I, as I mentioned before, this pathway is not always clear to you ahead of time. Right? Like, how to get to the operator is not always clear. How to get to the sub-goal is not always clear. Uh, and you might spend till the end of time before you're able to like identify the pathway. So combinatorial explosion is a serious problem here. I'd like to raise some deeper problems for this, however. So even supposing that this would work, there are some more fundamental problems kind of with this whole research program. So where we've gotten so far, presented the basic research program, showed what it illuminated, the problem of combinatorial explosion, now let's go a little deeper and ask, what are some 
really serious problems with the research program itself that they didn't really grapple with during the kind of 70s when this was in its heyday. So, what they were assuming is that all problems share an essence. Remember we talked about essences and categorization, right? A set of kind of common features that every single member of the class shares. Their assumption, the assumption that the, you make when you say you can build a general heuristic, a heuristic that works in every case, is that all problems share a fundamental essence. Second problem. The assumption that the problem formulation is actually the easy part. So, many of the problems that you face in your life are simply presented to you, right? They're simply given to you as here's the problem. So if you remember the kind of going back to this, what was given when they're talking about a problem, what was given before you start the problem solving process? What was given was the, yeah, the initial, and goal state. the initial state, the goal state, the operators, right? So that was before they even start asking the question, how do you solve a problem? They began by assuming that that stuff is sort of presented to you. And that's really not how your life is, is it? Right? Like for, uh, well, so let's distinguish two classes of problems. So two broad classes of problems, one where that is true and one where it isn't. Distinguish well-defined from ill-defined problems. So. Uh, 87 times 46, I don't know what the answer to that is, but I know what kind of problem it is, right? I know what the, I know what the initial state is. It's a well-defined initial state. Multiply those two numbers. I know what the goal state's going to look like. Like, is the answer to that problem going to be in a diagram of a duck or a fun little song? No, it's going to be a number, right? And I know it's going to be a number that's larger than either of those two numbers, but it's not going to be those astronomical numbers we saw before. So I know basically the range that it's going to appear in, right? So I know quite a bit about the goal state here, right? So the, the goal state is fairly clear. What? How do you know that it's going to be a number though? Like, like I, I know that that seems absurd to assert that, but like, how do you know that 87 times 46 is, can, can you, Nail down, you know, that you for sure know that it's going to equal another number. Yes, um, because I was given in, as we all were in elementary school, the, the, like, this problem was defined for us, right? This problem was, and furthermore, so which operators you're supposed to apply to it were also well defined, right? So we were told, basically, we were just sort of very clearly told when you multiply two numbers, you get a number, right? So with respect to that, you have like a set and stone kind of context in which you approach it. That's right. That's right. So uh, it was very clearly specified for us what the answer to a math problem like this should look like. So I always, I always get nervous when people use the word subjectivity and objectivity because almost no two people use those words exactly the same. Um, so what do you, can you say more about what you mean by subjectivity and objectivity? probably do the similar way, and there's an answer, right? There is one and only one correct answer to that math question. You can give different answers, but some of them are going to be right, and some of them are going to be wrong. Yeah? 
So that's part of what makes it well-defined. The conditions for giving a good answer are clear, super clear. Compare that to ill-defined problems, like taking good notes. What are good notes? What is that even? What operations do you apply to do that? Or even worse, going on a good date. What are the relevant, what is that, A, what does the goal state of that look like? Who knows? And probably no two people think it's the exact same thing. What are the relevant operations to apply? Now, maybe singing a little song is a good move, right? Maybe not, maybe don't open with that, but like, so radically unclear what the initial state is, what the goal state is, and what the relevant operations are. Yeah? Could we, uh, let's imagine that, because there are different kinds of problems, mm -hmm. what if uh, categorizing problems is sort of like, I guess the underlying question of like cognition of that, you, you, know, you, you categorize problems, and then determine which heuristic, or if you can, like for example, the well-defined category, like using an algorithm to solve problems. And then if you look at something like the prototype theory of categorization, hmm. imagine instead of it, instead of people categorizing like every single possible thing, they're only categorizing types of problems. It's hard for me to imagine hmm. if there's an infinite number of or, or infinite type, infinite categories of problems, right? That there are different problems of like kinds, but... So, maybe, maybe. Yeah. Uh, partly, the, partly the problem is that uh, problem solving seems to underlie categorization as well. These, these, these seem to be tangled up together. So the way that you categorize problems probably has a lot to do with how you're going to solve them. Right, but how does it, then how would you apply a different heuristic to different, like for example, the way that you would approach, you know, 87 times 46 would be like very different from the way that you would approach like the ill defined problem of like taking, taking notes. notes. Yeah. But you, but you are able to do that. You're, you're able to determine pretty quickly how to solve a problem. That's going to turn out to not be true. Okay, so that's where we're going next in the lecture. So the problem, actually categorizing problems turns out to be one of the problems you have to solve before you can start solve a problem. Uh, knowing what type of problem that you're looking at. So your instinct is right that categorizing problems is crucial to the problem of intelligence. So, so but we'll get into how that's actually kind of really, not kind of, it is really hard. Yeah? What if you have a well-defined problem, but it's not easily computable, but something like a carbon sale? Yep. Yep, that's fine. So this is, to be clear, this is not a distinction between algorithmically solvable in finite amount of time and not. This is, a, this is a deeper distinction. It's a distinction between questions for which the goal, initial, and operators are clear, and questions for which that is unclear. Yeah? Is it a matter of complexity, or is it a matter of just, like, who's to say that, you know, take the notes that there isn't, you know, wide enough complex these are the steps of taking notes, we could boil it down to that. Like, is, is this what? complexity of 87 times 46 being simpler than take good notes, or is it just... I don't think it's a matter of simplicity. I don't think, and so my, I think that it's a matter more of the clarity with which the parameters of the problem are defined. Yeah. Um, but we'll, we'll see. As we get, as, keep that in mind as we get into insight problem solving and see where your intuitions go. Okay, uh, sorry, to, I saw your hand first. So operators are the moves you can make. So you got, a, you got your initial state, and then the question is, what moves can you make through the search space? Sure, sure. So in that case, it's not the operators that are ill-defined, unless you want to make diagrams, I suppose. So do good notes include diagrams? Do they include little drawings? Uh, that's one question. So, But once you've got that sorted out, yeah, more of the question is the goal state. And what are the relevant operators is also really, t really tricky. Yeah? So if you issue with like ill-defined problems that you need to break them down into, into 
well-defined problems? I mean, like yeah. Like the problem isn't like good. The problem is like I need to take notes that I can remember. I need to take notes that cover the stuff on the slide. I need yeah. to take notes that you know. Yeah. So very often that's the problem. Very often the thing that you're trying to get done is to transform an ill-defined problem into a well-defined problem such that you know at least before you can even begin the problem solving process how to begin to try to wrestle with it. Yeah. With respect to their question about breaking problems into subproblems, does that not always introduce the problem of an almost infinite question of how much you can just break the problem down into subcomponents? Is there an atomic kind of subproblem we can break a problem into? Often. Yeah, often. Where the operators are just simple, draw a line, move a chess piece, write a number down. Those seem to be like Is that applicable? Do we know that that's applicable to everything? Well, we haven't solved this problem, so we don't know. Yeah. <laughs> these are all these are all like wide open questions, so Okay. So the assumption of Newell and Simon was that the problems that they're gonna be feeding to its general problem solver are all well-defined. A huge portion of the problem solving process was just kind of handed to them. And you can see this in the kinds of examples that they picked. Solving a logical derivation. Well, there's a very short list of things that you can do in a, a logical derivation. You can use the axioms. There's a limited number of axioms, like 10 or something like that. You can apply those axioms to whatever you're working on, and those are the only moves you're allowed to make. Think about playing a board game or chess. The moves you're allowed to make in a typical board game are very, very constrained. In chess, you're not allowed to like, oh, now my queen can fly, and I'm putting it in my pocket, and now you can't take it. Like, that's not, you're not allowed to just make up moves, right? So the set of moves you're allowed to make in a well-defined problem are clearly and explicitly given. Whereas, you know, go on a good date, but live a good life. This is a problem we're all facing. What are the relevant operators there? Who knows? Now, you can turn that ill-defined problem into a relatively well-defined problem. So, I'm trying to be an academic. So that very, and I think that's leading me hopefully to have a good life. So the very ill-defined problem of leading a good life now gets transformed into the relatively well-defined problem of trying to hack it in academia. So we can do this transformation of taking an ill-defined problem and turning it into a relatively well-defined problem. And then we can apply sort of standard heuristic problem solving techniques. Here's the trick, however. Sometimes, what looks like a very well-defined problem, or we've, we've, got, we've got a thing that we think is a well-defined problem, turns out not to be. So here's an example. The nine dot problem. Here's the problem. Connect all nine dots with exactly four straight lines. The lines have to Begin at the end of the previous line. Give it a go. Take a, take a sec on this. Okay. Anyone still want to keep working on it? Typically people, when they see this for the first time, think, oh, super easy. One, two, three, oh, oh no, okay, yeah. One, two, oh, one, two, oh, ugh. Okay, so here is the solution. And people get very annoyed when you show them this on average. There's a lot of there's a lot of research on, there's a lot of research on this specific problem. People get very annoyed and they say things like, you cheated, you went outside the box. But there's no box. There's not a box there. By the way, this is, this is where the phrase think outside the box comes from. Uh, they tried to, in a later, in an experiment, they tried to facilitate people solving this problem by giving them the cue, think outside the box. And it didn't help at all. 
No facilitation from telling them that. The, it's the most useless thing you could tell somebody. Yeah? I believe so. Yeah, I believe so. You can, you can astonish me and everybody else if you come up with a solution, but I'm pretty sure it's impossible. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, are there other cues they try? Like, you yeah. can draw a line outside of the like, space established by the dots. Uh, yeah. So we'll, we'll, talk a, we'll talk a bunch about this problem, actually. So we'll get into later some of the cues that actually helped and some of them that didn't. One cue, just a preview, one cue that actually helps is just to draw a big box around it. To, to visually indicate that there's, you're allowed to move inside that space. But most people, if you don't do that, if you don't give them clues, by the way, the, the solution rate for this problem is statistically, it's not zero, but it's statistically indistinguishable from zero. So if you don't give people any help, most people don't solve this. Uh, so what happened? Why is this? And so here, here again, so to speak about uh, your question about complexity, this is not a complex problem, right? It's not a super complex problem. Compared to all of the problems that you face just to get here today, this is relatively straightforward. So what's wrong here? Why aren't people solving this like no problem? Here's one way to think about it. They have misframed the problem. There's probably two ways in which most people, average people, misframe this in, in two ways. One, you think of it as a box, right? And that you assume that you're not allowed to go outside the box. Two, you think of it as a connect the dots problem. So you've all done, everybody's done connect the dots, right? Where you just like, there's a bunch of dots and you connect the dots and it makes some pretty picture. Yeah? Um, so uh, in connect the dots, you're not allowed to change directions where you're not at a dot. Right, so two places here, we've changed directions, not at a dot. If you change directions when you're not at a dot in a connect the dots problem, you don't get a pretty picture. You just get some messy nonsense, right? So given that you've probably, I don't know how you did it, but many people, most people frame this as I have to stay inside the box and I have to do connect the dots. You frame the problem, the, avail the set of available operators of moves that you're allowed to make to solve the problem are the wrong set, right? So you're, you've, the connect the dots thing, you've got the wrong set of operators. The going outside the box thing, you've got the wrong goal state in mind. So you specified the goal state as four lines that stay inside these, this box, whereas that wasn't the proper way of thinking about it. So, even this relatively simple problem, the fact is you just don't have the well-definedness that you... Th so the problem is people think that they have this as a well-defined problem. I know what this problem is and I know what, the, uh, what I'm allowed to do to solve it. But in fact, they get it wrong. This type of problem is what's sometimes called an insight problem. We'll spend a bunch of time talking about insight problems. So sometimes the hardest part of a problem is figuring out how to formulate it. And that's what was left out of the Newell and Simon GPS research program. They assumed that problem formulation was the trivial part. You know, they just give you a problem. I think this is a symptom of somebody who's been in school for too long. Because in school, they, they formulate the problem for you, right? They give you the problem. Whereas in life, in almost your entire life, not just like after school, but like in your life right now, most of the problems that you're facing are ill-defined. It's not clear what the goal state is, and it's not clear what operators are available to you. So if you got it, so an insight problem, in some sense, insight problems are not a type of problem. Because the characteristic of insight problems is simply that you think you've got the problem framed properly and you don't. And what you have to do to solve an insight problem is apply the problem solving process to problem solving itself. So you need to apply problem solving to your problem formulation. That's what we do when we're trying to solve insight problems. Yeah. Do you not think of the insight as more like an expansion to the rainbow of what your problem space is? Like you can just expand the amount of information that you have to start. 
So Newell and Simon will actually pursue that as a, as a way of dealing with insight problems. It'll, it's going to take some debate to get them to the point where they admit that there's such a thing as insight problems. And what they're going to say is that insight problem solving is a search through a space of problem formulations. Very complicated. That's the problem. That's the problem. It is wildly because you can't just, so let's go back to our Go back to our nine dot problem. What are the space of all possible ways of formulating this problem? Is it a big space or a little space? I think it's probably big. I don't know, maybe, maybe it is little. Um, I was just guessing. <laughs> okay. Ah, the uh, guess and check heuristic. It's, it's good. Well, it was a 50 50. So. Um, so you have to, just to preview where we're going to go a little bit. You're going to have to uh, search through a space and then to see if there's a solution in it, and then switch to another search space and search that space to see if there's a solution in there, and switch spaces and search that space. Because you can't tell from the, when you're looking at the different search spaces you could be searching, you can't tell from, from, from 10,000 feet which one contains a solution. You have to go into the search space to search it, and then into another one to search that one. So, it becomes very computationally difficult to do that. Can you kind of take the approach of just having like a, a higher dimension kind of search space that includes those other sub search spaces kind of folded into it? Does that make it computationally cheaper? I, okay, so let's leave that aside until we get, because we're, we're going to come back to that. We'll, we'll come back to this stuff uh, later. So let's, let's put that aside for now. Okay. So. We're gonna spend a bunch of time thinking and talking about insight problem solving. Uh, and so here's, let me just do another example. Here's another insight problem. It's called the mutilated chessboard problem. Okay, so consider little dominoes, you know, like dominoes, just a thing that would cover exactly two squares on a chessboard. You're not allowed to cut them in half, right? Gotta keep the whole dominoes. So chessboard, it's eight by eight. It's got 64 squares on it, right? So to cover a regular chessboard completely, you would need how many dominoes? 32. Okay, that wasn't the problem. Hang on. Okay, so um, okay, so regular chessboard, you can cover it exactly with 32 dominoes, no problem. Now imagine taking out two corner pieces, two opposite corners. Now the question is, can you cover this uh, chessboard? completely without any overhang or overlap of the dominoes? No. Oh, and prove your answer. There are no dominoes, well, it depends which two you take out, but in the picture, there are no dominoes that have two of the same things on them. Right, right. That's the second time this has happened to me. This, is, this happened when I taught this course last summer and somebody just got the answer. That's the answer, by the way, yes. <laughs> Um, usually people that find this to be a very difficult problem, a very difficult problem. Uh, famously, one very mathematically astute person filled 10 notebooks trying to prove that this is, that no, you can't do it. So did, did everybody, by the way, catch the solution to the problem? The solution is the following. So the answer is no, and let me prove it to you, that you cannot cover this evenly with 31 dominoes. Notice that one domino must cover both a black and a red square. One, each domino must cover a black and a red square. Now, notice the color of the two that we've taken out. They're both red. So, given any arrangement of dominoes, each domino must cover both a black and a red square. We've got two red squares left out. Therefore, it is not possible to evenly tile this with no overhang or overlap with 31 dominoes. Okay, so that's the solution. Now, most people formulate this as a tiling problem. What they do is the following. They go, okay, I got a domino here and here and here. Okay, I need to do a little turn. Okay, and here and here and here. And they try to just fit, mentally fit dominoes into the space. 
Now, how many different ways of tiling, let's go call that the tiling approach. How many ways of tiling the chessboard do you think there are? The answer is lots. There is a humongous number of ways of placing tiles on this chessboard. And searching through that space is incredibly computationally challenging. Hugely computationally challenging. So if you've approached this problem as a tiling problem, you're in deep trouble because you face a combinatorially explosive framing of your problem. Yeah? The way that you're thinking about the problem has frustrated your attempts to solve it. You thought it was one type of problem. Turns out, and it's not that you couldn't, I mean, conceivably you could explore the space of all possible tilings, but that's really, really hard. You're probably not gonna get through that in your lifetime. The thing that you could do is frame it as, let's call it a parity problem. That is, each tile, each domino has to cover one of each. Yeah? So by changing the way that you formulate the problem, you can turn a computationally intractable problem into a computationally tractable one. And that's insight. So insight is when you, when you take your problem formulation and transform it into one that's better for you to solve the problem. Insight problem solving. Again, this is, this is the magic that was missing from Newell and Simon. This is what they couldn't, what they assumed away in their model of problem solving. Say, I'm just gonna hand the computer the problem formulation, a nice cleanly formulated problem. I'm gonna tell it what operators are available and I'm gonna see if it can make it through the space. Well, the hard part, the human level intelligence is very likely deeply involved with problem formulation turns out to be very often the hardest part rather than a trivial part that can be fed into the system. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so now I would like to make a couple of radical suggestions. One of, one, one of them is that this insight about insight tells us a little bit about the limits of logic. The limits of logic. Not in the sense that solving the nine dot problem or the mutilated chess problem are illogical or contrary to reason or anything like that. Hopefully those two problems struck you as, yeah, that's all pretty reasonable. I hope. But failing, so think of, think of the problem formulation as kind of like a logic. Right? It's a system of reasoning in which, you can, in which you can participate. If the hard part of problem solving is insight, that means that the hard part of problem solving is not doing the logic, it's figuring out what the relevant logic is, the important logic, which is the one that's gonna be helpful to you. And there's no logical deduction that you can do, as far as anyone can tell, to figure out which is the right logic to be using. Nobody's, no, certainly nobody's come up with that, with that algorithm. Um, so, by the way, this is why characters like uh, Dr. Spock and Mr. Data from Star Trek are like conceptually impossible. Um, they say things like, you know, we shouldn't go down to the planet, that's illogical. But that's not what logic is, that's not what logic does. Logic is the deduction of consequences from premises or axioms. What they mean is it's irrational. So let's separate logic from rationality. Rationality is the ability to solve your problems in a way that gets you through your day or through your, gets you to your goals. What they mean when they say something is illogical is that it's irrational. Yeah. So, uh, and these, let me make the case, another radical suggestion, that 
Essentially that emotions, being ha caring about things, is inseparable from intelligence. Emotions and rationality are not separate things. Why is that? So we've been talking about this, the finitary predicament, the idea that we're in being intelligent, being really intelligent, is as much about managing your cognitive resources as it is about applying a logic, applying a problem-solving technique, applying a heuristic or whatever. Yeah? So, uh, Damasio in Descartes' Error is a really fascinating book tells a story of, for example, people with profound deficits in their emotional processing, really like strange emotional processing, who are intelligent in the sense that they are able to solve well-formulated problems, like an IQ test, for example. An IQ test is a series of well-formed problems. It's a series of problems for which the relevant operations are fairly clear. They explain to you what the relevant operations are. So people with profound emotional deficits from brain damage or whatever uh, can do very well on IQ tests. But Damasio tells the stories of some people for whom they're really good at IQ tests, but if you give them the following problem, they absolutely seize up. Would you like to write the test in red pen or blue pen? Now, what answer would you give to that question? Doesn't matter. Who cares? That, I, far, I think, I mean, unless you have some strong built-in preference. If you're like, I really love blue, that's fine. That's a good answer. Yeah? I think there was a psychological study that said blue pink helps you remember better than Re pink. Really? Yeah. Really? Okay. A perfectly good way of making this decision. That's a perfectly good way of making this decision. Uh, I think if, the, if you didn't know that psych study or if you didn't have a strong preference from one or the other, the correct answer would be, or a rational, let's say a rational answer would be, I don't care about that. That's not important right now. That's not relevant to me. But if you're unable to, reg so having a profound emotional deficit, so makes you in some cases, not all cases, but in some cases, makes you unable to say, I don't care about that. So they will just infinitely compute the advantages and disadvantages of having a red or a blue pen to the end of time, not the end of time, but you know what I mean. They're, for a really long time, they'll, they will get stuck on this problem because what they're unable to do is like decide that they care or don't care about something. So this is the very beginnings of the thing that I said, I promised that we would be kind of focusing on for the rest of the class for this overall theme of the course is that intelligence is not separable from caring about things. Caring about things is how you apportion your cognitive resources, right? You know where to spend your energy and where not to spend your energy. Your very finite, limited energy, right? There's only so much brain power you have to apply to anything. And if you don't try to manage that, that if, if you say, if you don't get frustrated because you're not solving something, then you wouldn't know to step out of a problem space and look for a better one. Yeah? What about, let's say, people who just don't care about anything, or are just absolutely apathetic, or have some kind of emotional, psychological issue that causes them to just not kind of give a damn, for lack of a better word? It's unclear to me that there's anybody who doesn't care about anything at all. Um, I think that there are, it's, it's quite possible to care more or less, but uh, I think that caring about things, and this is, this is basically the, the argument that I'm going to make uh, throughout the rest of the course, caring about things is fundamental to human cognition. And it's, it's not the case that you can just have zero of that. Um, you can have dysregulation in your caring about things. So uh, if you're familiar with the case of uh, Phineas Gage. So famous, if you've done Psych 100, you probably heard of Phineas Gage. So Phineas Gage was working on the railroads uh, and he was hammering a, a pole into the ground, I think, and with uh, blasting powder under it and unfortunately went off and went straight through his skull. Uh, and he was fine in some sense of fine, as fine as you can be with a pole through your head. 
Uh, he was talking and conscious uh, minutes after uh, they removed the thing. He lived a long life. But what, and he was, as far as anybody could tell, intelligent in the sense of being able to like, sort of think logically. So his logic was unimpaired. His ability to say, here are my operations. So give, if given some set of operations, he could crunch through those operations. He could talk, he could do math, he could reason in the normal sense. What he lost was some of the ability to regulate what he cared about. So he would do things like swear all the time. He was un incapable, incapable of, he knew he wasn't supposed to be swearing in polite society, but he did it all the time because this part of his brain was like knocked out. Uh, he was incapable of doing long-term planning because he became incapable of caring about the long future. Yeah? If he knew he wasn't supposed to do it in society, if he felt guilt or remorse from that, or shame, well, did that by a sense of caring? Or is no, no, no. So having, a, having, the cogni having the propositional knowledge, I'm not supposed to swear, is different than having a, a, a sort of like putting cognitive resources into regulating your behavior. Those are two different things. So you can know that I'm not supposed to do this thing, but not spend the mental energy to, to follow through on it. Yeah? Yeah? Is it like sociopathic like that? Like they know it's wrong, but it's Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm not sure what's going on with sociopaths. I don't know much about them. I don't know much that's, about that's them. That's the definition I, I, I hear, so I'm not sure what's going on. The, the, okay, the little I know about them is that it's a, it's a, so sociopaths care about themselves, uh, what they fail to care about, what they fail to have is empathy. So the suffering of others. So for most of us, hopefully, when somebody around you is suffering, that makes you feel bad too. Uh, whereas a sociopath just doesn't have that kind of emotional connection to the people around them. So uh, it's not that they don't care about anything. Sociopaths can be very effective in, in the world. They can be CEOs and politicians, for example, right? They, like, they can be very effective problem solvers, very effectively uh, uh, manage their cognitive resources. What they, what they have is, and I, I'm always baffled by people who seem to be jealous of people like this, like, like as though caring about people is this terrible burden that, like it's, in ethics, it's, of, it's often the sociopath problem. Like, okay, sure, but what about the sociopaths who like, this doesn't seem to, you know, empathy doesn't seem to touch them. I would, I would never want to be like, like, that seems like you're missing something so crucial to our, your humanity. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. No. Uh, I just have a question. Um, so if what you care about drives your decision making, how do you make decisions about stuff that you actually don't care about? Like two colors of pens and neither of is your favorite color. Like you have to pick one to take a test, but how does that decision-making process work? Okay, so the, the deep question of how you make that decision, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. But I, I take it that what's, what, our, what our emotions and what our values do for us is tell us a little bit about how much cognitive energy to spend where. So if you're like, I really, like, suppose you're just indifferent between the blue and the red pen question. It makes no difference to you. You haven't read any good studies about memory and red and blue ink. Uh, you just say, well, I'm just not gonna spend any time on that. I'm just not gonna like, I'm not gonna apportion my limited cognitive resources on the blue versus red pen problem because I don't care about it. And I'm just gonna pick one. And you just sort of mentally flip a coin or something like that, or go with what's most familiar or something like that. Um, think of all the things that you don't spend time on. Like you don't, you, you have to not spend cognitive energy on practically everything, given all of the things that you could care about you have to not spend time or energy on almost all of them. So, and what, what do you use? What do you use to regulate your very finite resources? Well, you use your values. You, you care about yourself and your fellow humans and your world, and you use those values to decide where you're gonna spend your time and energy. Uh, and if what I've been telling you is right, then that means that you're not gonna be able to build an artificial intelligence without building artificial emotions. That is, if what I've been telling you is right, 
And this problem of the finitary predicament, the problem of figuring out the rational way to apportion your cognitive resources is central to intelligence. Then you're simply never going to build a genuinely human level artificial intelligence until or unless you figure out how to make computers care about themselves in the world. Yeah. Okay. No, no, this is, that's a really, it's a really good question. So um, I'm kind of mashing some issues together here. I'm kind of squishing some stuff that, together that might be usefully teased apart. I would fail to see how like caring and saliency, like they, they seem very interrelated to each other, but if all I, I need to, to have is kind of like my weighting in which I add to something, do I really need emotion for that? So these are not super well-defined terms. So but let's, let's try to hash it out a little bit. You, what we need, and the argument going forward is gonna be this. What we need is some capacity. The thing that is absolutely necessary is some capacity to do what's called relevance realization. Relevance realization is gonna be the concept kind of going forward. Realizing what's relevant, that is figuring out what's important. Okay, so that's the cognitively core capacity that's tested by things like these insight problems. So these insight problems, what's going wrong with them, we're gonna argue, well, I'm gonna argue for you, is that you think you know what's relevant. You go into the problem saying, ah, I know what's relevant, and then it turns out that you're wrong. Now, uh, do you need to have a rich emotional life to solve this problem? Probably not, probably not. So solving this, solving the nine dot problem, you probably don't need to have, you know, cried at sunset or, or like read Tolstoy or, you know, you probably don't need a rich inner life to do that. What I'm arguing is actually a, a bit broader than that. It's that to have human level intelligence where we not only reformulate our problems, we decide which problems to face in the first place. What? So, if you're facing a very well-defined problem for which you have a computationally tractable algorithm, I would say you don't need any of this relevance stuff at all. So there's, a, sorry, I was a, there was a chain I was trying to build between. So there's relevance, that is you have to figure out what's important. Uh, and then you've got values. Values are kind of your guide to what's important. And then values get expressed as emotions. So relevance and values, cognitively speaking, are probably the core elements of this. I'm using the word emotions because kind of it's more evocative. And I do think in the long term, unless you, until you understand our emotional lives, you won't understand how our values work. And if you don't understand how our values work, you won't understand how relevance works. And the core argument that I'm gonna be making is relevance realization is absolutely necessary for even solving this kind of problem. So what happened, I think what happens to people when they're doing this problem, unless they happen to solve it like that. Did you see this problem before, by the way? Ah, okay, I'm gonna, you know what happened? So next time, I, if I teach this course again, I'm gonna give you a black and white version of this. So one of the, th one of the ways you facilitate solving this is by making them different colors. So I'll make it harder for people. You're supposed to be baffled and confused and then I come like a savior with the correct answer. That's, that's what was supposed to happen, it didn't happen. Um, so, what happens to, well, I, I think what happens when an insight, when you're doing an insight problem, typically what happens is people will explore the search space as it first appears to them. So they're like, okay, I'm gonna, I think I know what kind of problem this is, I'm gonna work on it and work on it. And well before they exhaust the search space, they get frustrated and annoyed. And that's a kind of an emotional cue that you've misframed, right? So your, your annoyance with the problem and your feeling of lack of progress is one of the feedbacks that you use to, to determine that it's time to step back and try to reformulate rather than, rather than uh, grind away forever inside the problem. It's time to step back and reformulate the problem. And if, you, if you're really like 
really stuck, you might ask yourself, do I really need to solve this problem? And then you're again, you're again asking yourself like, where am I spending my cognitive resources? And if a, if a being gets stuck in a pointless problem forever, is that being really intelligent? I would say it's much more intelligent in that case to refuse the problem rather than to like continue to try to solve it. Yeah. So you've had your, your hill in the valley. Yep, you know, your hill climbing. Uh, Um, in a very limited way, yeah. I mean... Is that emotion? <laughs> no, no, I don't think that's emotion. No, no. So again, uh, to be very clear, what I'm saying is relevance realization is the core capacity that we need to do human level problem solving. Uh, if you're in a hill climbing situation, uh, the, the problem is formulated for you already, isn't it? So the problem is formulated, the, uh, the feedback, if you're doing a hill climbing algorithm, the kind of feedback that's relevant is well specified. Uh, and indeed there are hill climbing heuristics that do this like, oh, I'll just jump around a little so I'm making sure that I'm not in a local minima or a local maxima. So that's not really the kind of full blown human level cognition that I'm suggesting that we're trying to model. Yeah? Okay, so we're I'm I'm really jumping far down the far down the argument when I talk about emotion. Uh, the core thing that I'd like us to focus on is relevance realization. Okay, so relevance realization and the the distribution of cognitive resources. I'm going to come to talk about this in terms of cognitive economics. So what we have to do is assess the costs and benefits of various operations that we're doing and spend our cognitive resources wisely. Now the benefits half of that is a value judgment, I would say. Yeah. So what's the benefit to you of solving a given problem? What does benefit look like? Those are questions about what's important to you, what's relevant, what's valuable. So that's how values get into this picture. The connection between values and emotions, uh, let me just admit that that's a little looser. Uh, that's a kind of intuitive connection. I think that's part of the broader picture. I think that's where it'll have to go, but that's not something I'm going to demonstrate rigorously for you. The bit that I'm gonna demonstrate rigorously is the connection between relevance, realization, and cognition. Yeah. Okay. That's probably enough for today. Sorry, that, I, I ran and we blew through the material. So let's call it a day and we'll come back and talk more about problem solving next week.